open and to broaden the debate when we want to. Um, I'll just very shortly introduce to you the, uh, the panel participants. Stephen, you know. And then <laughs> there's Anne Carlson, and she is um, development coordinator at a nearby secondary school. Then we have um, Chief Technology Officer, um, uh, Ingrid Mjelpe from Udinet. And for those of you who don't know what UNIT is, it is uh, UNIT develops and operates the Norwegian Research and Education Network for universities, university colleges, and research institutions. And then we have professor, we have two professors, both in the field of education. Ingvi <laughs> um, comes from the University College at Lillehammer, and Morten Flaterhausen. Uh, who comes from the uh, largest distance education um, institution in Norway, NKI Distance Education, which is a private institution. So each of these four members now will give a short presentation, maximum three minutes, to tell you something about their pedagogy, pedagogical or things they might be interested in, interested in that connects to the theme here today. Uh, and Stephen, you will also have the opportunity then to ask questions to these people. Okay, we'll start with Anne. Okay, yes. So uh, my name is Anne Michelson, and I work at Sandvika High School, which is a high school very close to Oslo. And uh, our school actually is very uh, pretty far advanced when it comes to use, uh, using technology in school. and. Um, we have a conference every year, and uh, this year one of our um, main uh, subjects was actually the flipped classroom that you have been talking about here at this conference also, and that you're going to talk about tomorrow, I think. And um, I wanted to, to say something about all these different roles that the educator has now, because as an <coughs> administrator at a high school, it's going to be very uh, complicated to be assured that all these different roles are... Uh, uh, taken care of at, at the school and uh, certainly uh, the educator is struggling enough as, as it is in Norway with all this technology that they have uh, in Norway. All, um, all high schools have a one-to-one, -one, um, uh, so every student has a computer. And I just wanted to say that it was very nice to listen to this uh, presentation because I really re uh, recognize a lot of the things that Stephen Downs was talking about. Uh, to be a connected educator, which is so important. And uh, I was talking at the school leader conference last week in Lillestrøm and trying to get persuade more of the Norwegian educators to be online, to write on their blogs and, and participate in Twitter and try to figure out what's going on and, and, and sharing that with other school leaders because I don't think in Norway that we do that that much. But uh, anyway, it was uh, using the RSS feed, as uh, Stephen showed with the Google um, reader, that I picked up the flipped classroom uh, just uh, this spring. And I was fortunate enough to be able to go to the ISTE conference in, uh, in um, Philadelphia, which I would recommend for everyone to go to, actually, because it's a great big conference. And uh, I got to meet some of the people behind the flipped classroom. Aaron Sams and Jonathan Bergman, and I persuaded them to come to, all, to Norway to our conference. And uh, the flipped classroom uh, concept is very interesting because uh, instead of the teacher lecturing in front of the class, they would actually make small videos of their lecture and then put them out on, on, online for the students to look at before they come to school. And then they, when they come to school, they are more prepared for what's going on. And uh, we had an interesting discussion because we also had you and Macintosh at our conference. And he had, on Twitter, said something that he was not very uh, fan of the flip classroom. But as it turns out, it's actually that he's afraid that the flip classroom will be the end in itself, uh, because it's, it's a way to the goal, but it's not the <coughs> solution to what you're supposed to do in the classroom, because you are supposed to, as Stephen Down says, uh, try to have the learner as the person who is responsible for what's going on in, in the classroom. And I uh, quoted you here in my, uh, when I was talking last week that you say that um, we need to move beyond the idea that education is something that is provided for us and towards the idea that an education is something that we create ourselves. And of course, if the teacher is 
doing the flipped classroom and giving instructions, then certainly they are not uh, creating their own education. But if they have this basic uh, knowledge that they will get when they're watching these videos, and they will be able to do a lot more interesting stuff in class. You just have, I, I forgot to look at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's got a couple of minutes more, somewhere one minute. And, and, uh, and Ewan McIntosh says that the educational system is working a lot of uh, uh, crazy about problem-based learning, but it's always the teachers who are creating the problems and making them and giving them to the students and then trying to make them differentiated so they, that they reach the students' uh, level of participation patient, but it actually it should be the other way around. It should be the students who find these problems, and that certainly is what's going on in your online courses where they create their own content. Um, it is a little difficult for school leaders to kind of say that this is the way we want it to be because we have assessments, and I didn't hear how you would assess 2,100 participants in an online course, but uh, that's the way that it is in our school, certainly, and we are working towards an uh, exam that is uh, not like the future <coughs> school is supposed to be. So, uh, so what would be the punchline of your presentation? <coughs> well, a, a punchline from the conference last week was that we have to change the education, and I'm with the, the exam system, uh, because teachers are very focused on, on the exams, which they should be, because that's what gives the students grades to go on to high school. Uh, universities and colleges, so we have to be uh, aware of, of the exam. So perhaps change the system at that point. Thank you so far. Okay. Next in line, Ingrid. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I found it to be interesting the, that uh, Stephen Downs wanted to uh, sort of close down teaching as it is, and then you end up end out with presenting 25 roles of teaching and being an educator, which to my, my math would mean that we have to extend our teacher education with four more years. <laughs> because it's a, really, it's a really complex thing you're presenting us for here. Um, so uh, what you really say is that you're sort of, uh, uh, you like complexity theory and um, you, you're making you're making a map where the the, the act of the, the person who is named a teacher a very very complex one and I can subscribe to that I've been, I've been a teacher I am a teacher and there wasn't uh, any of those uh, descriptions you gave that really su uh, surprised me or I felt you know, not too comfortable with but there are a few more roles I would like you to reflect on and that is a, a role I, uh, I, I encounter sometimes, and that's the role of the special educator. That's one. And um, sometimes I also comfort my students. I, I tend to, uh, I need to go into there even to talk very privately and to support them in emotional problems. So where is that role in your, in your, in your list? And sometimes I even have to discipline my students, particularly when they behave badly and, uh, you know, uh, say are nasty towards other students or don't uh, act uh, properly. So that's, uh, that's my aim to, to make your list of uh, roles more complex. <laughs> and then there is uh, another trend in what you're saying that I would describe to be a very hedonistic one. Uh, I find it whole list and your presentation is, uh, you know, is boiling with happiness and your assumption is that every learner learns by pleasure and goes, attains their goals by following their intense pleasures of learning. I must admit that there has been some moments in my own career where, where the amount of pleasure was relatively small. <laughs> there, was, there was a sense of duty and there was a sense of power and, uh, and a lot of musts and shoulds, and not so much about, um, yeah, about pleasures. So is, is, is your philosophy here a hedonistic philosophy? And where are the other dimensions of human learning? And I, I would 
be a little bit nasty here and say that you, you, you entertain a certain, <coughs> certain amount of regressiveness while teaching is also about progressiveness and, and pushing students forward. <coughs> and if they do that all the time by themselves, as you suppose they're doing, uh, uh, you, you sort of uh, entertain the, the regressive. Uh, regressive teaching is about doing what you already know and entertaining and don't facing challenges. So, is, is, is that my opinion? Would that be? Yeah. <coughs> For now. Oh, okay. Okay. We go on with Ingrid. <coughs> I'm not the teacher. Um, I learnt during your talk that I'm an alchemist trainer, I think, uh, and an alchemist organiser. Um, we also double in tech support, broadcasting, uh, teaching people how to share things um, and collect and, um, well, mostly to share, really. We don't care that much about them collecting. The reason I'm here is that the Ministry of Re Research and Education uh, has started a five-year program for the universities and university colleges called eCampus, where we want to lift the infrastructure and the best practice for digital education and the use of network support for education. Um, it's a five-year program, uh, 70 million Norwegian Corona, 10 million next year, uh, primarily to be used for flexible education in the northern part of Norway. And what we want to do is to scale from the enthusiasts, the pilots, uh, the ones with the burning hearts, to the everyday hands and hearts and minds um, of the teachers, the professors like you, your target group, mm -hmm. and the students, not the least the students. Um, and the way we do that is by, well, sharing specifications, some of them very banal, like if you have a microphone, it should at least fulfill this specification. So some technical specification, um, some things that we do in a bias club, so we all buy to the same specification and get the lowest price possible. To be able to organize education across organizational lines, whether they be inside an organization or between organizations. And this is really important uh, during the big reorganization that has hit our country in higher education. Mm -hmm. And that will continue to keep hitting us for the, at least the next 10 years if the predictions hold true. So what we're seeing is that digital education needs to span distance and time. That's something you all know a lot about. We need more than text. And we need to empower our education to a greater extent that we have had up until now. And when I say span distance and time, there's flexible education, uh, getting access to data. If you're doing a research-based education, you need to bring the research into the education, independent of space and time. I'm really opposed to the term distance education. Uh, it should be near. It should be, you know, coming into me. Um, students have a different body part that one extra from when I was a student. And it looks something like this. And it lives actually on my body. Uh, it's not a distant thing. This is really a near thing. Uh, it's also something that we need um, when we need more than text, I don't just need text messages on this, or on this, or on my PC. I need uh, sound. You need that for research when you do uh, collect interviews, for example. We need more videos. If you're doing flipped classroom presenting material, you will probably need to make more videos and know how to make them, make more audio taping than you knew taping. I just dated myself. Um, Digital tape recording. I know it's not a real proper term, but we need to know how to do that. We need to be more alchemists. Uh, we need to have, be able to have video conferences that work the first time, the second time, the third time, and the fourth time we do it. It should just <coughs> work the way it should be, I think was the quote. Uh, and we need to enable sharing of resources and media in an efficient way. We need to capture not just the presentation of material, but also the reflection, the discussion, uh, the interaction, and be able to share that. 
Uh, and we need to empower the students. That's something the students are lobbying for, uh, student active learning forms, supporting different models of learning and teaching. Uh, and that's something where we've been lobbied by the student organizations. So we need to follow up on that. And that's what we're working on. That's e-campus and that's you e are yeah. well, When will the in-campus be sort of there for everybody to use? It's partly there today uh, for the universities and university colleges. We have bits and parts of this available, uh, web meetings, video conferences, parts of the video capture solution is there. Mm -hmm. uh, media management is something we're working really hard on now. Um, simple little things like sharing files that are too big for email. Just okay. removing all the ro roadblocks um, is Thank what you. we're working on. Thank you. Last person, uh, Martin. <coughs> and you have asked to have something um, on the screen. <laughs> hey, first of all, uh, Stephen, I really enjoyed your presentation, and as Inga, I would like to suggest one more role, uh, the role of the fundraiser, <laughs> <laughs> because I think it seems that a lot of this work is uh, volunteer work, uh, which is good, but uh, not working everywhere. Uh, we were asked to, to uh, give a little uh, theoretical background of our position. So I want to share this YouTube video with you, and I hope it will work. Um, the sound is gone down. <laughs> if someone help me with the sound. Uh, the, the reason is that, as most people who have birthdays, and I had mine a couple of weeks ago, I realized that it's quite tough to have a birthday on Facebook, because you have to deal with all these congratulations. But one pretty nice uh, congratulation I got was this video from one of my students in Portugal who made this in one course I taught. And it pretty much sums up uh, some of the things I wanted to say today. What I also wanted to say is that I think, uh, as you suggested, it's very important not to teach the teachers with four more ye extra years of education to learn all these rules that, uh, that uh, Stephen said. We really need some division of labor here. And uh, I think that's a crucial issue. And I also would like to include uh, the students uh, to be part of this uh, learning community. And that was kind of what I tried to, I wanted to, to show you with the video. But I don't, we don't have time for this. So I am on the advisory board on a project, a European project which deals with virtual schools and virtual campuses. And the idea with sharing this uh, slide with you was that there are now quite a number of virtual schools out there. Uh, they have, this project has uh, by now collected 31 uh, schools in Europe and they're working on a worldwide global basis. And they are, they, these are schools on secondary and primary level. And from what I, here you're saying, Stephen, you primarily deal with adults. Uh, but uh, we also need to take care of virtual <coughs> educations with kids from grade one and up. And we also, as Singh said, need to deal with students with learning disabilities and challenges and so on. And I don't think uh, this is uh, well dealt with in your presentation and, uh, so far. I know that you have thoughts on this, but it is worthwhile mentioning. And finally, uh, coming from NKI, which is uh, Scandinavia's largest online uh, educational institution, I think we need to realize that when you have an educational organization with us, we have 12,000 students, 400 courses, 150 <coughs> part-time teachers, and 60 full-time employees, you need systems mm -hmm. You need uh, ways to organize all these people, all these courses, in a systematic, continuous, and cost-effective way. And I think it is a challenge to deal with the kind of courses that you have uh, shared with us today. How we can do this 
in a large scale online environment, having students from secondary school to university letter, uh, level, and having a lot of part-time teachers and using this in a cost-effective and economic way. So that those are my inputs to, to your talk so far. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. <clears throat> it's important to have sort of that perspective as well from a private institution. Um, Stephen, do you have any comments on this stand to what you heard from these four people? Anything you want to comment on? Oh, do I have comments? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but I'll keep them brief uh, because I've just had an hour of your time, uh, and, and I really want to be fair. But uh, I think it's reasonable to, to respond to some of the points that were raised. Uh, first, and, and I'll, re I'll respond to each uh, presenter in turn. First, the, the question of assessment was raised and, and the question of how you assess 2,100 people. Uh, or if you look at the artificial intelligence course, how do you assess 250,000 people, which is the number of people they had signed up. Their numbers have dropped a bit, but still. There's two major threads here. Um, and the one major thread is to use automated systems, and that's what they're doing in the AI course, uh, where you have online quizzes, you do the quiz, the quiz scores you, that's your grade. Um, that's obviously not ideal for many reasons. Another way, and, and I think probably we're, we're going to see happen more in the future, is something that is currently classed under the heading of learning analytics, <coughs> but which will probably resolve into something a lot more concrete. Learning analytics looks at what you as a learner are doing in the network and measures that. And learning and analytics mapped against uh, a network of practitioners ought to, in theory, be able to tell you where you are vis-a-vis -vis that network of practitioners and be able to put you on a scale of some level of skill or assessment. That's another extreme. extreme. And in the middle, we have things like uh, you know, game-based or accomplishment-based type learning. Uh, represented by badges or, or uh, skill levels as they do in games and things like that. And all of those are different ways of approaching assessment. The main thing is the idea of giving a person a test and then having a, somebody, a person, mark that test probably isn't going to work on a massive scale. I don't think it works currently, which is why we have such bad testing even now and, and all the debates about testing. I, but I, I think the main thing is we're going to be looking at much more sophisticated ways of assessing, of assessing performance in such a way that you can't game the testing system, and that, which is the big problem with any assessment system, including traditional testing. I mean, John Holt in How Children Fail <laughs> observed, you know, the first thing children learn in a class is, is how to game the teacher and how to pass the test, right? And, mm -hmm. and only secondarily do they actually learn. Uh, interesting, uh, <laughs> the question was asked, am I a hedonist? <laughs> um, <laughs> which, is, which is interesting because I'm a utilitarian to a large degree, uh, which <coughs> does follow the, the principle of maximal happiness, and I think happiness is important and people should have it. And I don't see anything wrong with that. Uh, utilitarianism, at least, is formulated by John Stuart Mill, though, talks about levels of gratification, deferred gratification. It is better to be Socrates discontented than a sheep contented. And the hedonist make no such distinctions. Uh, there is such a thing as what Seymour Papert called hard fun, right? Uh, where, you know, you do really difficult things and you swear and you curse, it's like playing rugby, but at the end of it you say, I'm really glad I did that. Uh, in Canada, of course, we have hockey. I understand you play a version here, too. <laughs> uh, you know, and I've played lots of hockey. And it's, it's, it's a brutal, miserable sport, and I love it. Um, you know, 
there's there's always this line that, that begins with, with duty, with responsibility, with powers, with musts, that shoulds, and ends with dictatorship. And I'm always cautious about that line. Uh, you know, it's too easy for us to say what people should be doing. And, and a lot harder for us to trust that people know what they should be doing. I fall firmly in the camp of trusting people. I'm a Democrat at heart. Uh, I believe the people are right. I believe individual people are right. I think people should be free to make their own errors. And yes, you don't want children to harm themselves, but you don't prevent harm by, by handcuffing them and tying them up. Uh, you prevent <coughs> harm by ensuring that their environments are safe. So I'm, I'm in favor of safety rather than restraints. Any comments on that thing, then? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I can stop here and we can proceed with the discussion rather than me continuing. I think that would probably be the way to go. Okay. Do we have any comments right now? Do you have anything to that? There is. No. Um, but I'd like to hear um, some response to, to Morton's, uh, um, <laughs> not to his video. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. You got the point, didn't you? <laughs> There's, there's 12,000 students, X number of teachers that I lost track of all the numbers, but I got stuck on 12,000. And in other nations, it's even larger, right? You know, in China, it's like 100 million students or 200 million students. Let's imagine you're trying to set up an educational system for 100 million students. Here's one way of doing it. Divide the 100 million students into lots of 30 people and then find a separate person for each group of 30 people. Now, if we were starting off that way, we would laugh. That, that, that is ridiculous. That you can't find that many teachers for that many students. And of course, historically we have, but we sacrifice a lot. You know, When you have one person for 30 people scaled to 12,000 or 100 million, uh, you're really stretching the capacities of those teachers particularly when we examine the roles. Imagine we structured society that way, where for <coughs> each person in society, we will have one person who functions as the policeman, the fireman, the plumber, uh, the chef. It would be stupid. Nobody would do it, right? So I totally get the need to sy systematize. I totally get the need for efficiency. But when I take those parameters and apply them against the current system, I can't make the argument. That is why, as you suggested, we really need a division of labor. That is the underlying reason why we have to get past this teacher-student model. Yeah, there are roles that these people play. Huge, important, vital roles. And I sketched a bunch, and I've had a bunch added. Right? But you can't just take one person, 30 people, or one person, even 50 people. And, and, you know, it, it's just not efficient to do it that way. So you take a person in a role and larger groups of people. Right? Uh, and you take a person in a role across a whole network of students. And that allows your professionals to specialize. That allows your professionals to target and that, that allows your, your entire network, thought of as a network and not 4,000 <coughs> classes, to function a lot more efficiently. I could go on, but I won't. Uma, you raised your hand. <laughs> yeah. OK, I learned that one, one shouldn't always answer immediately. It's, it's a good thing to give it a few minutes to think. <laughs> and about the util utilitarianism, uh, which is a very interesting point, because uh, for, for like 50 years or so, we resisted John Dewey's philosophy in this country because he was a utilitarian <laughs> and pragmatic. Uh, so uh, we were very care we were careful about those uh, dangerous things in this, uh, this country. Uh, but what you actually also said, that uh, when uh, things went uh, sort of wrong in your course because you feel, felt alienated. Uh, you sort of gave up because you, you said that was the way things should develop. And you said something that democracy is the thing and the majority rules. 
Well, that is also a very difficult thing for me because then you also say that the truth is uh, always belongs to the majority. Uh, and education is also very much a question about uh, handling not only knowledge, but also truth. So we can't always make that equation and settle with uh, the majority of a group of students that are keen and eager and want to uh, pursue their own things and say that this is now the common knowledge. This is what we know about this subject. So there is a one a very essential point, and that is the authority of the teacher, and why the teacher has such an authority. And uh, going to the uh, to the original meaning of the word teacher, it means the person who has the right to point out things. <coughs> and in that process, you also grasp a sort of power. The power you have to point at what is worth pointing at. And that role of the person being the one who has the right to point out is very crucial. And uh, uh, it's, it's also said you, you point out things because you know you need to discern them from the context. And the process of pointing out is a reduction of complexity. And if the teacher is not there, or the educator is the problem as well, is not there to reduce complexities for the students. Um, well, the students is lost in complexities. I won't give you the word now. I'll pass the word to Morten, uh, simply because of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I, I, I struggle with this because uh, I really enjoy and like what you're saying, Stephen, because I've been reading your writings and thoughts for quite a long time. Um, and my, my, my struggle is if I see this from the point of view from a, an institution or the, the administration of an institution that are going to, to try to uh, try out some of your thoughts in a large scale environment where we have, for example, as MPI, 400 different courses on different topics. And I, I can figure and imagine that we can do this for a few courses, but to do this on a massive basis, having all our teachers, all our students, and all our different courses up and running, using your ideas here. Uh, I think it's, uh, I can't imagine how I could do that, because there are so many courses, and there are few students in each course, and how can we do this? Uh, are there anyone? Any institutions that have used your, your tools and set up more than a few courses? <coughs> and what are the, the, so the, the experiences? All right, obviously not, right? I mean, the, the <coughs> connectivist courses we've been offering are three years old. There have been a total of like 15 of them or so. So clearly no school division has adopted this as a whole. Uh, but school divisions have adopted elements of this. Uh, you say, how do you adopt this? Well, think about how technology began to be integrated in the schools. Uh, instead of making sure every teacher knew everything about technology, what typically was done is schools hired somebody to take care of technology. Uh, the computer person, the computer lab person, etc. Maybe. I'm saying that, assuming that happened here. That's what happened in Canada. So that role of specialist came into play. As I pointed out, historically, as new technologies, as new needs, as new demands have come into the educational system, we have split off a role from the teacher. Okay, So it's not like we're going to take this system and you know transition it right away what I'm describing. It's not, that's not going to happen. And that would be a stupid thing to do. That would be a careless, uh, wild, manic thing to do that only an insane person would do, right? Um, you move gradually. Uh, you say, you, you hive off, is the phrase, right? Hive off a certain segment of the teacher's responsibility and assign it a system wide function. Also, and in tandem, you talk about the 400 classes, and again, I mean, particularly, and I love your points about complexity, 
Um, given the complexity of the current informational landscape, it becomes less and less reasonable to divide, to divide subject matter into classes. Um, you know, I remember when I was in school, they started experimenting with electives and things like that. I'm the product of that. Uh, so maybe they shouldn't do that. But, <laughs> but, you know, over time and gradually, you move away from a class and subject-based kind of learning to a more experiential kind of learning, a more project-based kind of learning. And these are all pedagogies that have been applied in schools. And you know, again, uh, you have entire school divisions, uh, for example, Peel in Ontario, uh, <coughs> constructivist methodologies. And that's a step in, in the way and on the way. Um, very soon, we'll stop. Do you want a question or a comment? Yeah, I haven't responded to you. So I feel badly. Um, what I'm hearing is that there's something about change, but I'm sitting here wondering if it's changing the way you want to work and you want the students to work, or if it's changing the content, or and if there's a difference. Uh, because what we see is there a dem there's a demand for sharing beyond the LMS. Um, and handling the groups and the close communities in a coherent way. Uh, and that needs to be in the hands of the students. Uh, an example is we have, we have the past year had a web meeting solution, not Illuminate, but Adobe Connect, mm -hmm. where we gave access to the students to be meeting hosts. And we're the first ones to do that large scale. And what we see is somewhere between one third and half of the meeting hosts are students. They are initiating their own meetings. Mm -hmm. And this is very different from the from two to four you do this and from four to six you do that approach to teaching. Uh, and I'm wondering if the discussion you are having now is the uh, letting go of the control of how but keeping the control of what. You have 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> You're learning. <laughs> I would like to let control of, let go of control of what as well. Okay. Uh, I don't think the thesis that there is a core foundation that everyone must know for all time can be sustained. Argument to follow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, this certainly shows that we are moving uh, somewhere. And yeah. your presentation, along with your comments, show us that we don't quite know how, but we are moving and we are learning from you and from all of you. Is there anybody in the audience that you have some burning questions that you want to ask? I'll give you 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Is there going to be a flipped classroom in Sandvika, Lidergården School? Uh, oh, but they're already doing that. Mm. Huh? Mm. Oh, yes. Very good. Flipped classrooms, read more about them, just use the Google and everything. Uh, thank you very much. And that's another role. Certainly, mm -hmm. thank you to the panel. Uh, drinks are waiting. Um, dinner as well. Enjoy your meal. And we'll come back tomorrow after the meal. Yeah,